Good morning. Hello, hello. I love all the red I'm seeing today. Um, if you have a, a Jesus, Jesus One shirt on, will you give me a quick wave? Thank you. We have sold over 120 shirts and sweatshirts for um, the Zachary Hoff Power Scholarship and Mary Shannon Ministries. There is an, one more week left, so you have an entire week. Next Tuesday is the last day to get your order in. Um, I helped some ladies last week with their orders, so if you would like to order with me, I can help you right after study out in the lobby. I'd be more than happy to help get that to you. Most of you should have gotten your shirts in like one to three days. The shipping is one to three days. So especially if you're here, you usually get it within like one to two. So you have another week. You can order them on FCA. It's on a T. You can go to Shannon's Instagram or Facebook or you can come find me for that. Remember that we do not have Bible study next week. We will resume January 9th and 10th. So we have three weeks off and then we'll be, we will meet back again for the new year. If you have a Bible that you brought to donate and have not donated that yet, you can leave that with me in the lobby as well. Uh, we have about 30 Bibles that you ladies brought this morning. So that's amazing. I will be taking those to the Phoenix Rescue Mission later this week um, for their Winter Wonderland event. Thank you so much for showing up today. We hope you have a lovely Christmas break. Enjoy it. If you're going home to the cold, God bless you and be with you extra because uh, it's going to be cold. But if you're here, enjoy your holidays and we will see you in the new year. How's everybody doing? Good. Woo! People are staying home, getting ready for the holidays. That's what's happening, right? This morning I got up at the crack of dawn to go to Christian club and um, it was it was good, um, but... I did not want to get out of bed. I mean, that thing, went, and I know, like, I should be up and perky at five, but I'm not. And um, when it is dark and cold, I'm like, oh, my goodness, how much do I love Jesus and how much do I love teenagers? Um, so anyway, I did that. So uh, I told Colleen I wasn't going to tell this crazy story, but why not? Y'all are always interested in my stupid stories. So uh, yesterday, I had the craziest thing happen, and um, so I was on the phone with one of my friends. Um, he called, and I missed his call, and said, give me five minutes, and so he goes, I need some godly wisdom, and I thought, oh, brother, and so uh, I said, well, I've been spending a lot of time with Jesus today. It was Monday. I said, so maybe, like, you'll get some from me. You know, it'll be a great deal, so I call him, but I'm talking to him in the grocery store, and it's in regards to, you know, sports and leadership and teaching and all that stuff. And so I'm kind of a, a good combination for that topic. And so I'm getting my, my main stuff and I'm talking up a storm, you know. And every now and then I would look up and I did see this guy standing there. Like, and you know, I'm nosy. Are y'all nosy? Like sometimes when people are in conversations that are intense, I'm like, just try, like, it's just interesting. You're like, oh, Okay. And so, but I didn't pay any attention to it. And um, so anyway, we get off the phone and in just a minute, this man comes over to the aisle I'm at. And first off, y'all need to know, I looked like a disaster. Okay, I'd been running that day. I started back yesterday. Oh, by the way, if anybody wants to start back, uh, like the power walk or running, I, I pulled up an old app because I'm tired of being fluffy and out of shape. And, bec and how, why do we lose it so fast? It takes so long to get it. And then what happens? We get knocked off our rocker and then we can't get back on it. So I pulled out my old app from the couch to a 5K. Has anybody ever done that? That app is awesome because you're listening to music and this woman comes on and she goes, now walk briskly. And then you walk briskly and then she comes on, now jog. And then, and so she times it to where you walk a minute, run a minute, walk a minute, run a minute, and you're kind of getting yourself back going. So if anybody's interested in being in that app with me and my community and we'll keep each other accountable, let me know after because we got to start this thing. And most of us are like, oh, we'll start after Christmas. No, I could be 10 pounds heavier after Christmas. You can't leave a pumpkin pie in my refrigerator. Do not. So anyway, I look like junk. I had on yoga pants and it wasn't pretty and hat, hat, ponytail, the whole thing. This guy comes over to my aisle and he goes, not to be creepy or anything. Don't you love that, the entrance? <laughs> not to be creepy or anything. But I just want to tell you, you are beautiful. 
Okay, I went. And he goes, he goes, like, perfection, you are exquisite. <laughs> so I was telling Colleen and Steve this last night, and from now on, like, Colleen's like, Steve's going to get you a T-shirt that says, I'm exquisite. <laughs> so anyway, he's telling me this, and I'm standing there just dumbfounded, and then he goes, and... And not only that, like I was listening to you and you are really smart and the energy that comes off of you. And he's like, and I noticed you have on a wedding ring, so I am not hitting on you in any way. I was not going to come over here and say anything, but I thought, why not? I'm going to go over there and tell her what I think. And he went and he said, and I just want you to know you are exquisite. So I'm standing there and I'm <laughs> like, Okay. And I go, well, thank you very much. I said, you just made my day. I really appreciate that. And so anyway, he goes about his business and I call my friend back. <laughs> I go, dude, I need to talk on the phone with you more. I said, because this energy that's coming off of me, I am exquisite. And we started laughing. And so Rob is on graveyard. So, you know, we're like hit and miss right now. He's sleeping. And so I was at church last night and I was seeing my friends. I said, I cannot wait for my husband to wake up for me to say, dude, you need to pay me some attention. I'm exquisite. And so anyway, I woke him up and he, he goes, what is wrong with you women? I said, well, he says, I tell you you're cute every day and all this stuff, but no, if a stranger walks over to the bread line and says, you're exquisite, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I guess we expect them to maybe, you know, if a stranger did that. So you guys, I'm telling you, watch out at the grocery. <laughs> Pay attention. Things are happening at the grocery. But I was like, Lord, you know what? Maybe I needed just a little boost because I just started exercising. I was feeling thicker than a snicker yesterday. Like, oh. And so anyway, isn't it nice? But you know what it did tell me? And Colleen and I were talking about this last night. Put the, the man thing aside. Why don't we compliment each other more? Or when we see someone, you know, like we think about it all the time. I will see somebody and I think, that is the cutest lady I have ever seen. Well, you know what? I should walk over to her and say, you got it going on. I just want you to know you are darling, or wow, I love your haircut, or what, because it did put a spring in my step the rest of the day, and so, but now it's going to turn into a joke, you know, like, you better watch it, I'm exquisite, <laughs> so, and he goes, oh, so I just need to use better words, I said, well, you know, yeah, a little bit, so anyway, but uh, okay, we have one Last one before Christmas break, okay? Are y'all ready? And we are going into a phenomenal time of year, but it's extremely busy. And that's okay. I'm not going to guilt you. But just as much as you can, take time away and just spend a little time with the king. You know what I'm saying? To prepare for his birthday. Because we are looking at, the bottom line is, what does it look like when God is in control? That's the bottom line. That, that's the birth of the church, uh, of what we're seeing, that kind of life, is what it looks like when God is in control. And so I hope that it looks like that within your um, family structures during this season because we're celebrating the fact that the king has been born. And it's a completely different kingdom. It, it transforms all parts of our life and how we love and how we treat each other. And so I just want to encourage that. But to get into it, because it's hard, you know, I never end at the end of a chapter. So let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 5. And I'm just going to read so that we know where we were. And we're just going to, I'm going to kind of review us into where we are. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you that we can just come and hang out together as women, encourage one another, um, sit in the pews together, have a weekly contact of um, friendship and community and study in your word. And so, God, I pray that you would speak to us today, that you give me clarity um, and that I would be able to explain things that in my mind are so marvelous that sometimes I don't even want to attempt to put them into words. I, I just want to ponder them like Mary did in my own heart. 
But God, I pray that um, I don't give all the answers or tie things up in bows, that it's okay to live in, um, in the pondering and in the struggle and in the wrestling because it's in the middle of that wrestling that I believe your truths go the deepest. And so as we wrestle through this hard story, um, God, I pray that you would speak to each woman individually. I sure love you. Um, and I sure enjoy being with all of these gals. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Acts chapter five, but a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her outside, buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Remember, we have been studying the beauty of the early church and and what that was like, what that community was like, and the fact that they had dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They were experienced koinonia, a fellowship that is really about sharing. It's about sharing in Christ and then sharing all that we are and all that we have um, with our family of believers. Um, it was about um, no longer looking at religious symbols, but having a relationship with the fulfillment of those symbols, Jesus, and coming together in homes and the breaking of bread, um, understanding, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And you see this birth of this amazing new beginning, this community um, of what it looks like when Jesus is in control. And last time we talked about one of the descriptions of that, and I always want to go back to it, was that there were no poor among them. And you're going to hear through all of this, there are phrases that like spur, spur me to other parts of scripture, like hyperlinks. That was one of them. When there's, there's no poor among you, do not test. Why has, uh, why are you testing God or testing the spirit? All of that goes back to the book of Deuteronomy. And do you remember us talking about the big picture of what that is? Do you remember what Deuteronomy was about? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy, remember, was the second law. And so God has uh, kept his promise by raising up his nation uh, in slavery in Egypt, freed by Moses, passes through the waters, enters into a covenant with him at Mount Sinai, and eventually, after two generations, brings them um, to the edge of the promised land where Moses, right before he dies, gives them the second law, which is a picture of what does covenantal living look like. And remember why. Because through you, all nations will be blessed. The ultimate fulfillment of that is going to be through Jesus because Israel failed. But the only way as a nation you're going to be a blessing to all nations is to live in covenant relationship with God. And so the law is laid out. I mean, it impacted every part of their life. If you go through the law, it's exhausting, actually. It has to do with how they treat each other, how they treat foreigners, how they treat their body, how they treat money, how they treat their homes, everything. If you tried to legislate the heart, I'm not sure you could get any better than Deuteronomy. But what's the point? You can't legislate the heart. Stone tablets were never going to work. 
So what had to happen? We had to take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh that has the precepts of God written on them. And so out of the spirit comes this life. So what does it look like when God is in control? You see this in the early church. It is the birth of of this new kind of kingdom, this new life where we come together as a family and we have a common purse and it is a beautiful thing that you're watching take place. And one of the examples of it was a man by the name of who? That we had right before this. Barnabas, right? His name was originally Joseph, but they called him Barnabas. They gave him a nickname just like Jesus did, which it's like this camaraderie, this family. And he sells property and he gives it uh, to the apostles. And isn't it interesting when you think about the fact that in chapter two, they had already said that people were selling properties and bringing it together and taking care of each other as a family. But one thing I didn't point out to you is tell me about these properties, they're selling property in the promised land. Now, Barnabas might be selling property back from where he's from, from Cyprus, but many were selling their properties. How important is this to them? The holy promised land, like this is sacred. This is their inheritance. But what are they recognizing? We're going to see the same thing about the temple structure that these religious symbolic things, these earthly things are pointing to greater what? Realities. And all of those realities are found in the person of Jesus in his death and resurrection. And so they're letting go of their inheritance or their claims in the promised land. Why? Because in Jesus, he is the fulfillment of all of that law. He is our inheritance and the promised land to come. If you go back, uh, I think even in Hebrews, it talks about the fact that Abraham never saw the fruition of what God promised him in the land, but he knew that what he was looking for was what? a heavenly promised land that was to come. And so you're seeing all of this fulfillment. And so you have Barnabas, this son of encouragement, and he lays it at his feet in contrast to who? Ananias and Sapphira, who they want the recognition and the camaraderie and all that Barnabas has, but they don't want the cost. And so right away, and there's some key phrases. Do you remember how he says right off, I think in verse three, why have you let who? Satan come in. So think about this. If this is the new way of life, right? Jesus, his death and resurrection, he is the first of the great restoration to come. He is the first fruits of the great resurrection. And now you have it. If he is in control, here's what life looks like, community looks like. So who do you, it, it beckons back to Eden. For me, that's where I go back in my mind. What is Eden? I reviewed this with the high schoolers this morning. Eden was what? It was the beginning of all. It's where creation happened, right? It was, the main thing is it was God's space and man's space, what? Together. And you saw that. When did we lose it? When we decided not to keep God in proper authority as our king, that we determined we were going to know the truth and we lost that space. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus and by what happened at Pentecost, and now the spirit of God comes and dwells inside of us. Now we have man's space, God's space reconnected. And you have this new beginning of this covenantial life that is happening. So who do you think is going to show up and try to run it? The enemy. And he comes in and he starts planting that seed. And remember how I always tell you that I think that the Bible could be titled the tale of two seeds or the tale of two kingdoms um, because right away that's what you see. We were made in the image of God to bring his kingdom throughout the earth and the deceiver came and he planted a different seed and automatically after the fall you see it. In Cain and Abel, 
And you see these seeds, you see the fight between the two kingdoms. And the fact is the death and resurrection of Jesus, he's ascended on his throne. The lamb has overcome. And he is the king of kings and Lord of lords. And so you see him come in and he plants that seed. Why has Satan filled your heart? We reminded last week, what is Satan's character? He's the father of lies. He seeks exaltation, glory. He's all about self. What was Jesus like? Opposite. He is the truth. He is all about submission, submitting to the will of the Father, holding together, unity, sharing, koinonia, giving. And these are the underlying themes of this situation. And think about how Jesus was tempted. He, it, he was anointed into ministry. He was baptized, right? He passed through the waters. He's true Israel. He is taken out into the wilderness and tempted. And when he is, um, for example, let me show you all the kingdoms of the world. You can have all the kingdoms without the cross. And he said what? You shall worship the Lord our God and only God. He, every time in the temptation, he quotes Deuteronomy. What is Deuteronomy about? Covenantal living. If God is in control, what does it look like? And so he denied it. He quotes that. It's all about self and it's all about an earthly kingdom or an earthly empire. This is all that Satan has to offer. What has happened to the Pharisees? Because it's the same thing. They were to bring the kingdom of God throughout the earth and be a blessing to all people. And what happened? Instead, they became like the beast. They built a kingdom of power, oppressing the poor, seeking self-exaltation. It is all about them. It is not about freedom where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And he said to them, what? You are a bunch of whitewashed tombs. You are hypocrites. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, there is no life. And this is what we are seeing coming out in Ananias and Sapphira. It is the same seed that is happening. It's this hypocrisy. It is about appearing to be something that is not true on the inside. And so what happens? And by the way, isn't it interesting that I don't like it, but they're both involved, right? And they both receive this punishment. And, but it's interesting to me because it's like this new couple that's going to birth the seed that is being tempted and they're falling into it. But what happens? It is shut down. Why? Because this is the root of something sacred that is starting. And in the first one, think about in, in the garden. These are just my thoughts. I told you. You can write them in pencil, okay? Uh, in the garden, think about it. We get so much crud for this, right? It is the woman who reached out. And don't even get me started because I can show you how God has redeemed that in so many beautiful ways all through the scripture. Even being the one to appear before Mary Magdalene after his resurrection and allowing her to take the word of the resurrection. She was the apostle to the apostles. I mean, that is just redemption right there. But not only that, in this case, guess what? It was Ananias that did it, but she was what? She was complicit, right? So it doesn't matter. The fact is that united, they were complicit to this and God shut it down. And why? I believe we looked last time I showed you other instances where he just, you see that fast justice, right? And it always has to do with a couple of things. What are they? You remember? New beginnings, something new is starting, and it's always around the devoted things or temple. And so here you have this early church that now has be literally become the temple and together has become the body of Christ, the church, and it is brand spanking new and it's about to be released into the world. And God shuts this down. And uh, they are struck. Um, I put, instead of asking God to give them a generous heart, 
Give me the same generosity of Barnabas. They didn't want his heart. They wanted his recognition. Now think about this. How do you think this affected Peter? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, they are people. And these people, I mean, he just dropped dead right there. I was like, this would be a really good time for a psalm, Peter. And I think the psalm I would pick would be 139. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting. I mean, it, it's, do you read that story and, and kind of go, ooh, when they're struck dead? Because have you seen some of the same stuff in you? Hypocrisy. Wanting the image over the authenticity. Holding back. Oh my gosh. Right? But here, here is the thing. Remember it in context of what is going on. Um, I love how he says, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? That is in contrast to the theme of this section of scripture, which we're learning about the Holy Spirit. What? Filling us, right? So are we walking in the filling of the Spirit? Or are we walking in a different kind of filling? I, I think too, Peter has to still be shaken, For not too long ago, he lost what he thought was a friend when he sold Jesus into uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Of Of the leaders. Finish my statement. Does it make you feel better? At my age, I can't remember, you know, into the, y'all don't have a word either? He turned him over. Okay, basically. And do you remember the wording behind that? Luke 22, 3. Then Satan entered Judas, one of the 12. It's very interesting in John 12, 4 through 6. John, in, in that story, it's when the woman comes in and anoints Jesus with that expensive oil. Do you remember that story? And in John... Judas, uh, John says that Judas griped about it and said that it should be, the oil should be sold and given to the poor, acting one way on the outside when the motive was what? Different on the inside. And in John it says, well, we know that because he was a thief and he was helping himself to the common purse. I think it's interesting that, on, that John only blames Judas. But when you go to these references in Matthew and Mark, when they talk about this, it says the disciples. It doesn't just say Judas. It may have started with Judas, but where did it end up? Spreading to the disciples when they thought, why is she using this expensive oil? So what is the point with when a seed like that is allowed to be planted, what happens to it? It can grow. Absolutely. In verse 11, and I think that's the point, and that's the point of this swift judgment. In verse 11, it says, Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I think this is hard, right? Because when we hear about swift judgment like this, or at least when I do, I don't know what it is about me, it does bring about an incredible fear, a fear of, of the Lord. It makes me examine myself for sure. It makes me work out my own faith and who I really am and if I'm authentic. And that's why sometimes studying the scripture is a lot of pressure. It's so excruciating because I'm always evaluating me. And you always have to sit in the middle of the rub between this God who in a moment can speak And judgment can happen. And this awe and fear of the power of God. The creator of the universe. The one who is holy. Who we cannot imagine. We could not survive his presence. But for the blood of Christ. When you have to sit in the space of that. With understanding that we're to pray to him. Abba. Like daddy. This love, both of these things existing at the same time. I think it's interesting uh, 
when we looked at when God had given swift judgments, do you remember some of the examples? And one of them was Achan. Do you remember that? Achan was the one that when they did the battle of Jericho, he kept back some of the devoted things in Joshua. I think it's Joshua 7 or something like that. Um, and he was struck dead. Okay, but here's the issue that I thought, because we contrasted the similarity, let me contrast what's very different in the New Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, it is the people who were in charge of executing the sentence. In the New Testament, who handed down the sentence? It wasn't Peter. It was God. God handed down the sentence. He did not tell Peter to stone him or to send him, nothing. It was God who shut this thing down, and I thought that was very interesting. Boyce says this, whether or not you agree or not, I'm throwing it out there, but he says this, true Christians do not lose their salvation by sinning. The punishment of Ananias and Sapphira, though extreme, was for this lifetime. If you want to explore that a little bit, go to 1 Corinthians 11. There is another uh, scripture that talks about such things. 1 Corinthians 11, 22 through 34. That talks about what was happening when um, some of the Christians were not observing uh, the Lord's Supper with the correct heart. And that they were seeing some of judgments by God in sickness and in death because of these things. That God was um, showing some judgment there. And so I think it's very hard to sit in the space of the holiness and righteousness and awe and fear of God. And the loving father of Abba. And I think we see that in the meaning of their names. I think maybe I mentioned this at the end last week. The meaning of their names. What was the meaning of Ananias? God is gracious. Yet he struck him dead. So can there be grace in that kind of swift judgment? I think these are the things that we sit in and we ask, you know, why? I think there can be grace in this sweet, swift judgment. This is the root of the church. It's the beginning. We're to the point now where the church has many branches. But this was the beginning of something new. This was the beginning of what does it look like when God is in control? This is the setting forth of the church that is going to go out and be that stone in Daniel chapter two that turns into a mountain that fills up the whole earth. And so I think this section is awesome to sit in. You need to sit in the rub. So many people, when they get that feeling of the scriptures and how they don't work together, you just stop reading. You just avoid it. You never think of it again. Sit in it and think about it because in this world, we don't understand the why sometimes, but we have to trust the who. And so even when I look at my own life, like I, I sat here um, when I was out on my patio, just thinking about God is gracious, but uh, how he allows certain things to happen. And so sometimes it doesn't seem so gracious or the name, the names don't turn out the way you think. The name Zach means God remembers that God is going to act on your behalf. Okay, there's a little bit of a rub there for me. Why didn't you act on his behalf? Why didn't you save him? Why didn't you? We have all these feelings and questions about things. Of way, maybe it didn't play out the way that I thought it should play out. But then you back up and you go, wait a minute. He did act on his behalf. Absolutely, he acted on his behalf. Would I want him to return now? And take away the peace and the rest and, the, and all that? No. But it's hard to live in that struggle. I'm thankful that he went out quickly. I wouldn't have chosen that. But I'm thankful because he was going to deteriorate. And it, it wasn't a bright future in that case. And what could have happened? We have no idea what could have happened in the process. I grieve over things like, I'm, you know, I'm never going to have his grandkids. Which is awful. 
But then you think, as he deteriorates, what could he have done to a young wife? What would have happened with the, with the young babies? What would our life have been like? You can what if yourself into all kinds of stuff or ask the why. God, why did you do this? And why did you name him God is gracious? And then strike that when I feel like, gosh, we do things just like Ananias and, and Sapphira. But God has a plan and he is not going to let anything thwart that plan because that plan is for the redemption of the world. And although he makes choices on this earth, it may be the most gracious choice he could have ever made on this earth for this moment and for the redemption of all things. And so sometimes we have to sit in that rub. And I think we should. And I think if we ask Jacob, he would tell you that the greatest places to be is in the middle of wrestling with God. Because we may come out with a limp, but we come out with our name changed. And it is, it is sweet. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. Oh, I love this part. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't you love to be a part of that? How many of you are reading this on your own? I'm going to tell you, if you're not, you're just robbing yourself. You need to be reading this before and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And you need to be closing your eyes and putting yourself in that situation so that you're halfway there when you come to Bible study so that when I just tell you some of mine or bring it to life, you're like, yeah, yeah. And you should be sitting in the seats dying to tell me what you saw that I missed. Like this is what, this is what we do. So please get your face in the book. But Peter and the others continued to meet, and they kept going to the temple. Why? That's where the scripture, the scrolls were being read. They were continuing to go and experience the scripture and the prayers. And then what would they would do? They would go hang out at Solomon's portico where there was a lot of space, and they would begin to what? Teach and break it down and be the signposts that are pointing towards Jesus. By the way, the temple was not, well, it's not like a normal church, right? You're talking about dozens of acres, many buildings, many courtyards. There were homes within where the priests stayed. I mean, you can actually look at kind of like CCV. I mean, like there were all kinds of areas, right? But they would go to church and then they'd break off by the grill where there were a lot of, there's a lot of room and they would teach. And, and what do you think they were doing? They were doing what they've been doing. They were using the scripture to point to Jesus and say, he is the Messiah. And not only that, you killed him, but God raised him. We saw him, we were with him, and we saw him ascend. He is seated at the right hand, and they are continuing to preach. And I love it. So the apostles had taken up the habit of worshiping in the temple and the sticking around in one of the porticos where they would teach and heal. The crowds were coming to them just like they had come to Jesus. I love it because you're seeing the beautiful uh, fruition of the promise that through you all nations will be what? Blessed. It's bubbling at the temple. They're understanding that what the temple was pointing towards who he is is who? It's Jesus, that the prayers have been pointing towards Jesus, that the prophets have been pointing towards Jesus, and all of it is coming true. And they're still tied to the scripture and their understanding and learning, and then they're breaking it down. But where is the community happening? It's not happening at the temple. It's happening outside the temple. 
It's happening in the homes, in the community that is happening, and something new is beginning, and we're going to begin to see it break away from the symbol of the temple. Um, I, I, I was like, what did I just write right there? I put, when you see something, you can't unsee it. I love that. Have you ever studied and all of a sudden God allowed you to see something differently and you're changed forever? You can't go back. When you see something new or a new way, you cannot unsee it. There are certain parts of scripture that I was taught a certain way my whole life. And when I realized that they had nothing to do with how I was taught, you can't unsee it. And what happens is when that happens, do you know what else? A door opens up a little bit to go into the next scripture. Go, oh, well, if that didn't mean that, then what does this one mean? And then you're growing and it's beginning to apply to your life. They would gather and teach the people. Um, why did some of the people, why, why did most people not go with them? Like this community, why didn't they go hang out with them at Solomon's portico during all the teaching? It's dangerous. This teaching was in the face of the religious leaders, okay? What is happening? The religious leaders have been in charge of protecting the sacred things. They have been in charge of protecting the temple, protecting the scripture, protecting the law. My gosh, they have created so many laws to protect the law that they've burdened down the people. And, and this power has corrupted them. But this is their job. They've protected it. And now guess what's happening? You got something going on that is outside of your control. And so it's very dangerous. And so it is in their face and they want to squash it. I mean, think, put it in our practical terms. I started laughing, thinking about this. Think about the medical community, right? We don't want to break that totally apart, but think about the, think about big pharma and things like that, right? How does the, uh, Medical, like the, the traditional medical community, how do they feel typically about new, more natural ways of doing medicine? Not, well, you love it. Yeah, me too. Not great, right? What do we do? How, I mean, we'll go to even um, all kinds of situations to keep people in this trap so that it funds and we can be in control over them when maybe some supplement would do the job or some other medicine would do the job, but it costs $4 and everybody could get it and we wouldn't make any money off of it. This, this is nothing new. Okay, it started out with great intention because they knew if they didn't protect the law, if they didn't push the people, protect the temple, right, that they would be oppressed, they would be judged, but it has gotten out of control because that kind of power corrupts. And now they are absolutely blinded by their power and something has happened and now it is bubbling outside of their control and they can't stop it. And it looks like covenantial living. I mean, look at what's happening. This is a community who's selling their inheritance and giving it and sharing and they're loving one another and they're coming together in unity, but it's not happening at the temple. It's happening in the homes and in the community. They regarded this situation as incredibly dangerous. But it wasn't just teaching. It was healing. I mean, can you imagine? I want you to think about this. This is new. Jesus has said, you tear down this temple in what? Three days? I will raise it up again. We've seen that happen uh, with his death and resurrection, that he is the fulfillment of the temple, right? To me, um, I'm going to stretch some of you. So how, you, you've all heard about, you know, at the crucifixion that the, the my brain is dead today. The curtain, but that, that's not the word. The veil was torn from top to bottom. And, and most often, you have that taught that it represents that we now can enter into the presence of God. And that is correct. That is not wrong. Okay? 
But I also picture it in a different way because if you remember when Jesus left the temple the last time, he says your temple, temple is left to you desolate. Why? He is the temple. And at Pentecost, the Spirit of God goes into believers and they become the temple. And together we are the church that is going out to the world. And so with Jesus' death and resurrection, you see something brand new start. It is new life. He is the first fruits of coming up out of the grave. And what do you see? It? It's progressing. The Spirit is being, the presence of God is released from the temple. It is no longer behind a veil in the temple, but it is released and it is released into us. And we become like Daniel too, that rock that hit the empires of the world and made them stumble. The kingdom of God will be successful and it will grow into a mountain that fills the whole earth. We're seeing what happened in Ezekiel 37 where the dead bones come together and they're breathed into and they come to life each person. The thing that Peter said Joel was talking about, that Moses longed to see when the Spirit of God would fill individuals and the Spirit would be released. What I want you to understand, it is like new birth that is happening. He came up out of that grave, the Spirit left that temple, entered into the people of God, and here we go. And you see the picture of when they come out of the temple, it is like life. Do you understand it? If I could create a movie, I would do everything. And I bet CCV could do it because they do such good videos. But I, it, him coming out of that temple and everything becoming color. Like the, his shadow was healing people. And it wasn't about Peter. It's about new life. That is happening. That's how powerful. So when you see this seed, right, trying to be sown, this seed of hypocrisy polluting the root of the church, God says what? Nope, not happening. And he then starts preaching and keeps preaching and you see people being transformed and you see the spirit of God being released and everywhere they go there is life because that is what God brings and here's the thing who can stop the Lord God Almighty the kingdom will grow they're gonna try so let's look and see what that is like I got to look and see where I am. I know, but I, I'm going to make sure I told you everything I wanted to tell you. I got on a roll. I put, there is a crazy juxtaposition here though, isn't there? The holiness and awe of God. At the beginning, he strikes it down, Ananias and Sapphira, to stop that bad seed. And because he does that, man, you see the birth of new life. We see a glimpse of the great restoration to come as the kingdom begins. Oh, I know. The beginning of the resurrection. Do you understand like in Mark, I, I thought about this in my notes. In, in the gospel of Mark, there are four miracles in a row. See, this is so important that Jesus came up out of the grave. Because they're seeing new life not only impact their everyday life, but come out of death. Death brought that new life. And uh, there in, in Mark, there are four miracles in a row. And I love them. You're familiar with them. The storm. Okay, in the gospel of Mark, go look. It's the storm. The demoniac. Do you remember that? Where the guy is filled with the lesion of demons and, and Jesus cast them into the swine. Yes. Okay. And then after that, he, uh, they come back across, and right away you have Jairus, who has a daughter who is 12 years old, and she's dying. And he risks everything, his career, everything to come to Jesus, because he knows he's a healer. And when it comes to your babies, you'll do what you got to do to get that healing. But what happens? On the way there, there's an interruption. Who interrupts him? The hemorrhaging woman. The hemorrhaging woman 
has basically been dying for 12 years. Jairus' daughter has been living for 12 years and now she's dying. This woman has basically been considered dead for 12 years because she's been bleeding and she's unclean and she has lost everything. She has no relationship. She's on her own and she's spent all of her money trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And she realizes that Jesus is the Messiah and if he's the Messiah, there's healing even in his wings. And so if she can get to him and touch him, she will be healed and you watch her. And I believe her hope is to stay invisible so that nobody sees her in the crowd because if they do, she is in serious danger because she is making everyone unclean. And so you know the story. She stays, tries to stay where nobody sees her and she reaches out and touches him. And for the first time, we see a couple of things happen where Jesus did not have prior knowledge to a healing. Now listen, God always operates the same way. It is the will of the Father through the Son by the power of the Spirit. So God healed her through his Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. But he says, wait a minute, who touched me? And then you laugh at the story because Peter's like, are you being for real right now? Who didn't touch you? Who hasn't touched you? And he said, no, someone touched me. I felt the power go out because see, Jesus wasn't going to let her stay invisible. Because the fact is, she needed to know something. Jairus was there to stand up for his daughter. She thought she had nobody, but God the Father stood up for her and took her to the Son for healing. And so Jesus says, for the first time, and I think the only time, he refers to her as daughter, giving her back. You, your, your faith has made you whole. You have been restored. And then Jairus' daughter dies, and what happens? He goes in there. And raises her from the dead. Those are the four miracles. That's what we need to see. That he is I am. If there is a storm outside, he can calm it. He is the creator of all things. If there is a storm inside, guess what? He can calm it. Because one day he's going to destroy the enemy and send him to the lake of fire. And so his word can cast them out. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is king over creation, the natural, and he is king over the supernatural. And then you see him come and that is to be feared. <laughs> that is awe. But then you come to the shore and you bring it down to the personal. And what does he say? I see you. You're not invisible. I see you. And the Father is standing up. And I have come to make you whole. And to give you back what you have lost. you know why and how? Because I am the resurrection and I am the life. It's all you need to know. It is the awe of God and the fear of God and Abba Father all rolled into one in four miracles in a row. And it is so beautiful. And you see this happening here. It's new creation, this new birth. And the Spirit of God has come in and they are teaching and dedicating themselves to learning. And he's like, look, look who he was. Look who he was. And we've seen it. And he is the resurrection and the life. He's the first fruits. And because of that, we're willing to let go of the deeds of our promised land properties because it is about community and a kingdom that is following him because he'll restore all things. It's no longer about the temple because he is the temple and you see a complete life change. And when the Holy Spirit bursts out of there and Peter walks out of there, it's like everything is turning to color. And everything is growing. And it is the most beautiful picture ever. And the reaction from the leaders is not good. Okay? It is not good. By the way, I don't see this at all. I hate it when people teach it like it's a formula for healing. This is not a formula for some healer to walk down the street right now thinking that in their shadow, people are going to be healed. If the Lord wants to do that, he can do that. I don't think that's the purpose of this story. I think it is a beautiful story showing us the beginning of uh, new life, in my opinion. I think healing goes back to the story of Peter and John when they look at the guy and they say, God has given me something for you today. I think that's healing. 
When the Lord speaks to that person in regard, I have given you something to give to them. Whether it's healing, a word of encouragement, you are exquisite. Okay, whatever it is, all right? <laughs> oh, man. I put, we have no idea the plans and the methods of God. We don't ever see this again. We don't ever see this kind of healing again in the scripture. I can't tell you why later on Peter walks out free one day and James gets killed. I don't know. See, this is the problem living between the ages. N.T. Wright says this. He says it so good. In the apostles' age, they seem simply to have accepted that God can do whatever he pleases and that when people pray and trust him, he will often do much more than people imagine while accepting also that frequently things don't work out as we would like, that people still get sick and die. Nobody imagined these healings made them immortal. And that many sad, uh, sad and tragic things would continue to happen, which have no particular explanation. This burst of teaching and healing power came out of Jerusalem. It was the birth of something new. The power of the living God, Jesus, Messiah, becoming concrete, undeniable, real, and right in the middle of the most dangerous world. And because of this, what happens to them? They are arrested. And you got to love this story, right? What happens? Do you remember in verse 17? Did you read? They are arrested. And yet in the middle of the night, what happens? The angel shows up, lets them walk out. By the way, when they go check, everything seems to be locked up. They're just missing. Makes me think about how Jesus walked through the door in the upper room, right? But they're out. And then what does he tell them to do? Go back to the temple, okay? And go back to, yeah. And tell the people all about this new life. I love that part. And then when all the bad boys get together, like they get up in the morning, they get ready and they all convene and they're ready and they're about to call in the prisoners. They go and look for them and what? They gone. But then someone comes and says, they are in the temple and they are preaching. That's what they're doing. And I love the fact, go back to that verse where, it, where the angel tells them, and I love the fact that he says, and tell the people all about this new life. Do you know that nobody really could put a, a name to what was happening? Later on, it, it ends up being called the way. Okay, it's not until like Acts 11 or 12, I can't remember where some non-Jewish people out of Syria call them Christians, or in other words, the Messiah people. Okay. And so even the angel doesn't really give it. You just go and you preach to them and you tell them about this new life. Ponder that over this month because this new life, this new life that has progressed out of death, it's transformative. It is transformative. It does not go forth empty. God created, he is a God of life. He did not create anything to be empty or dead. Out of him comes life and he transforms our life. What does it look like when God is in control? I've been asking myself that a lot, to be honest. This is not about legalism, do this, do this. It's about a transformed life coming out. What does the kingdom look like when God is in control? And that is what I'm a part of. And it affects every aspect of our life. This season, we are celebrating the birth of the true king that was promised thousands of years ago. That someone would come and restore all things and crush the head of the enemy. He would set things right. The one that Daniel talked about would one day 
rise up and be presented to the ancient of days and he would be given a kingdom and he would have full dominion that would last forever. The one that the prophets preached about that when he came, he would restore all things and he would wash men with water and he would breathe on them the spirit and they would be made alive into a great army that would fill up the whole earth. This is who we celebrate. He is both king and lamb. We were given the choice, Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Barabbas. The cross or the sword. And in our human nature, we choose the sword. But it is the cross. It is the death of the lamb that brought life, right? We sing hallelujah. The lamb has overcome. That is personal. That means the cross wins not the sword. I think you can let that sink deep inside. When you're in a dilemma, when you don't know what to do, what does it look like when God is in control? The cross or the sword? Laying down your life, loving those who are hard to love, forgiving all of those things, that is what cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. It is powerful. It is love. Celebrate that. And by the way, tell your kids the stories, please. Grandmas, tell your grandkids the stories. Tell them. Moms and dads, do not leave it to the schools or to church to teach your kids the stories. Commit. Get in there. At night, read those stories unpeel it for them so that later on it can be put together and we just have a progressive revelation that is unreal but they need to know the stories all right lord thank you so much for today thank you for the privilege of studying your word and the beauty of what is laying out before us this new life it's in us and it will happen through us and so god may we be people who have a word to say about this new life and that it will not just be in word but it will also be in deed that it will be contagious that they just feel the energy they want to even be in our shadow and so god i just love you so in jesus name amen Ooh, you know what i just thought of i'm gonna tell you before i leave here because it just came over me do you know what it means to be made in the image of god that word image is the word um salem in the hebrew And the root of that means to shade. And so it's a picture that we were made to be his shadow. So think about this. What you do, your shadow does. It may not have the exact detail, but you can tell the shadow belongs to the real thing. And the shadow doesn't go off and live on its own. If it did, it freaked me out. If my shadow walked away from me, okay, it stays close, right? And it's a reflection of the sun. And so you have this kind of imagery. You never even thought of that with Peter and even his shadow, okay, was a healing effect. The Bible's so good. Get your face in it. Have a good day.